Ambassador Rosenblum, it's wonderful to be speaking to you at the embassy in Tashkent. We've always had conversations in Washington now that I think about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's super special actually to be sitting like this next to you after two years of the pandemic, you know, know. with so much virtual communication. Yeah. It feels weird actually. It does, it does. It feels weird to be sitting in the same room as people <laughs> when you're talking to them and to see their full faces yes, and not yes. uh, through a mask. Yes. So, and the so. embassy seems to be back full scale at work. It is, yeah. Our so embassy no more telework for you. No more telework and um, Although I have to say that the telework habits we developed during the pandemic will, will be useful and it allows us to do more things and be more flexible. But we're all back at work. Um, we're not even any longer wearing masks in the embassy. Mm. Um, and that's obviously a reflection of the improvement in the COVID situation. But you know, we're a little cautious because we've seen in some other countries in the world, COVID's come back mm -hmm. um, in new forms. And so we, we remain vigilant but it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great change, and it, it allows us to do things like this. We saw a long line of visa applicants outside, excited, mm -hmm. impatient, nervous, waiting for their appointments. And we see a crowded embassy, so in a way, back to normalcy. Uh, yeah, we're basically back to normal operations in our consular section as well. Uh, we're trying to make up for lost time. Mm -hmm. There's a big backlog mm -hmm. of people who are interested in both uh, immigrant and non-immigrant visas. And uh, our section, our consular section is working through that and trying to reduce the backlog. I do know that some people, because I, I hear this when I just meet people out in the city or around the country, are frustrated because it's not so easy to get an interview sometimes. Uh, you know, you have to schedule an interview for the visa. Uh, and there's so much interest and so much, you know, people are immediately filling up the slots. But we're going to work on that. We're going to try to meet all the needs. Uh, and, uh, and, and frankly, it's gratifying to know that there's so much interest in the United States in visiting uh, our country. And it shows that, I think, the depth of the ties between our two nations. Yeah. I mean, every Uzbek has an American dream. That's what we <laughs> see. <laughs> Um, I just um, interviewed um, Councilor Chief uh, Rob Romanowski. It was a great interview. And there we discussed how you don't have a role in that process, how U.S. Mm -hmm. ambassador in any country um, doesn't and should not interfere into the uh, counselor services process. Right. Uh, but I'm sure you must get asked a lot by ordinary Uzbeks and by others, including, I'm suspecting here, officials about visa processes. Yes. What is your answer usually? How do you, how do you get away well, from that situation? I, you're absolutely right. I do get asked a lot, um, even on random occasions. I remember once I was on a flight <laughs> flying back from Germany. I had gone to Germany for a holiday, just a, a weekend, and I was on an Uzbekistan Airways flight from Frankfurt to Tashkent, and the person sitting next to me recognized me ah. <laughs> and immediately began asking about a visa. So what I say, what I said then and what I say to people is the first thing is, um, as ambassador, there's actually a, a wall that's put up legally that I'm not part of that process, that I, I, I'm not supposed to be part of the decision-making process or even to influence it. Um, so that's the first thing I say. They usually don't believe me mm. <laughs> when I tell them that, but I, ins I, I tell them that's the truth. They look uh, at you with a suspicion like, ah. Oh, yeah, I yeah, he's, oh, he's hiding excuse, something right? or whatever. Occasionally, what I can do is at least give them information about who they should call or what they should do or explain the context. You know, for example, during the pandemic when we were so limited I had to explain to, I was able to explain to people why we were so limited. We were still issuing some visas, but on a very limited basis. And uh, so that's what I can do, but, but I, I'm not going to be able to solve their visa problem. <laughs> I refer them to <laughs> Rob and his team. Yeah, very often at yeah. the Voice of America, we get messages from our viewers and fans who say, hey, can you please talk to American ambassador? Like, you know, let him open the process, especially during the, during the pandemic, you know, when the services were not fully provided and things were restricted and, right. and all of that. And we do our best to, to guide them. It's a constant uh, conversation. It is. Um, and you know, it's actually, it's, it's, it's important, I think, for people to understand why it is the way it is. What I was saying about this wall mm -hmm, that's set mm -hmm. up between the ambassador and my role and the counselor section and the counselor chief, um, the idea is that there are rules governing how we issue visas and the criteria that are required for people to gain entry to the United States. And 
the people who know those rules and who are technically competent should be making the decision. It should not be influenced by political considerations or personal preference. You know, I like this person, so you should give them a mm -hmm, visa. Mm -hmm. And in order to avoid that, we've set up this system of separation. A good example to show how corruption could be avoided, can yes. be or should be avoided, right? Yes, exactly. A lot changed um, throughout the pandemic, as you know, and, um, and a lot changed since last year, since our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Afghanistan was a priority at that time. We talked about what would be the future of Afghanistan, what Uzbeks wanted um, in this process, and how you were working very closely with, with the Uzbek government to make sure that all the political parties in Afghanistan would find a common ground and, and, and take Afghanistan to a, to a new stage. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we have the Taliban in power um, in, uh, in, in Kabul. Um, in, I've had several conversations with the Uzbek officials about this. Um, before we get into, you know, more deeper into this, what were the visits about, recent visits in Washington? We had uh, Uzbek Foreign Minister Abdulaziz Kamilov uh, visit uh, Washington in early March, and then a few days later, uh, investments and foreign uh, trade minister Sardar Mirzakov was also there. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was the mission? Well, you know, first of all, both officials, uh, the foreign minister and the deputy prime minister, had, had not, hadn't been in the United States for a while. Both of them thought it was important to renew dialogue and to kind of uh, show the face of Uzbekistan in the United States. And I think that's very important to do on a regular basis. I think the foreign minister had last been in June of last year, so it had been... That's know, when he met the Biden administration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so. So there was a, there's a reason just to keep the dialogue going and, and do it in person when possible. And it's, again, because of the pandemic improving, it was, it was easier. Um, I think there's no question, and you know, I think everyone who's watching this will agree that the geopolitical and economic situation in the world and in the region has gotten very complex in the last yes. six months. Uh, uh, and that um, is a reason why we need to have an uh, uh, intensified dialogue about our bilateral relationship, ways that we can help Uzbekistan to deal with the complications of the, of the geopolitics and of the, the economic stresses, um, and you know, ways that we can cooperate and collaborate towards the goal of a more stable region and a more prosperous region. So in both the case of the Foreign Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, they had specific issues they wanted to discuss that concerned that those complications, whether it was the war that's happening in Ukraine, the situation in Afghanistan, dealing with the, the you know, the, the government that's there now, the Taliban-run government, um, how to keep momentum going for regional cooperation between Central Asia and South Asia and within Central Asia. Uh, that whole range of issues were, they were, they were bringing to the table um, and, uh, we, we had a lot of chance for a good frank discussion about them. And trade and economics as well, right? Yeah, yeah. As part of, uh, as part of bringing stability and prosperity to the region, mm -hmm. how can we increase our bilateral trade? How can more, we can get more interest from American companies to invest here in Uzbekistan and create jobs? Um, that was, again, all part of the, the, the dialogue. You know, obviously the, the, the focus was a little, was slightly different between the two mm -hmm. visits. The Deputy Prime Minister's visit was very focused on economic relations um, and uh, the trade and investment and so on, um, including, by the way, um, Uzbekistan's bid to join the WTO. Uh, that was that featured heavily. Um, where, whereas the Foreign Minister's visit was more focused on the sort of uh, relations within the region, the, comp the, 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 the challenges we face mm -hmm. with both respect mm -hmm. to Ukraine and Afghanistan and, and the like. But um, it was a they were productive visits, I would say. You know, uh, there was a, lo a lot was a lot of good information was passed, and a lot was achieved. The Uzbek government has been quite discreet, though, about these visits. They haven't really publicized. This was intentional, as far as I know, that they wanted to keep it more like behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and because these are sensitive times, as you know, and this yeah. this is all happening as we were still trying to find out what would. Tashkent's position be uh, regarding the war in Ukraine and uh, regarding the Russian, uh, you know, aggression, uh, mm -hmm. Russian war on Ukraine. And things have cleared a little bit uh, with Foreign Minister Kamilov explaining policy in the Uzbek Senate recently. Mm -hmm. 
Do you, as Uzbekistan's strategic partner, understand Uzbekistan's position? How clear is it for you? Where does Tashkent yeah. stand on this? Uh, I think we do understand it and appreciate it and respect the, the constraints and the, the kind of uh, tough choices that Uzbekistan faces. Uh, and again, the two visits that we discussed, we had lots of opportunity to really understand Uzbekistan's position, and I think that was, you know, part of the purpose of these visits was to explain explain that. Um, you know, we 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 deeply respect the fact that due to geography and history, Uzbekistan um, has to balance a lot of interests and has to get along with its neighbors, um, especially its uh, neighbors who are also trading partners and important sources of investment. Uh, in some cases, in the case of, for example, Russia, you know, a lot of uh, labor migration and sending who, labor migrants who are then sending money home, uh, which is an investment in the economy here. Um, those things are fundamental to Uzbekistan's survival as a country, and we so we do understand that um, entirely. Um, you know, the the situation in Ukraine. Uh, this is not the time to go into a long discussion about it because people are reading about it in the newspaper every day or seeing it on the news. I, 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 there's not much I can add, but it really points out the importance of some of the fundamental principles that we always stress in our relationship with Uzbekistan. And, um, you know, sovereignty and independence, that we always start out pretty much every bilateral meeting by saying we support and respect each other's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. These are international principles that are vital to having a stable world. Because once those principles go out the window, it's all about who has power and who can impose their will on somebody else. Uh, and sadly, that's what we're seeing with the Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine. But I think it has relevance for Uzbekistan because those principles are dear to Uzbekistan, and we, we've seen this throughout its 30-year history of independence. So, um, so it's important to have these frank discussions that we're having, to understand each other's perspectives. And I, I, I also thought, um, you mentioned the foreign minister's statement last week laying out Uzbekistan's position. I thought it was a, it was a very reasonable, clear, and um, you know, understandable uh, position. So um, anyway, to your question about us understanding and kind of appreciating uh, Uzbekistan's position, uh, absolutely. And we, we stand ready to work with Uzbekistan to deal with the challenges that this war has brought, brought to the world and to the region. Any um, hard feelings? Because, you know, you still expect things from your strategic partners, right? You want them to be with you on these are historic times. Like as w what we heard in, in Washington again and again was that this is the time for each country to choose a side. Mm -hmm. Like you need to know with who you are at this point. So, yeah. you know, Central Asians abstaining mainly and choosing to be neutral in general. Mm -hmm. And also a major factor here is that the public pretty much not just in Uzbekistan, in the neighboring countries, well, we don't know what's happening in Turkmenistan. Uh, for sure, but uh, the public seems to be more critical of uh, of the war than uh, the governments. Mm. And and in your decisions, in your uh, let's say choices and analysis, you take that into account, right? I mean, it's not just what you hear from the from the government, but from the from the people of these countries. Mm -hmm. So, how are you reading the public mood? I'm not going to pretend to know the answer to that to precisely. We, we, don't, we don't have a surveys or mm -hmm, anything that mm -hmm, we're doing mm -hmm. about public mood. Or, and I'm not sure that there are any public opinion surveys no, happening no, no, here no, no, that no. we could look to, uh, for, to, for, to understand that. So what do we have to go on? Well, there, you know, there's just talking to people in your daily life, you know, talking to the people you meet in the store or that you see on the street or visa applicants, I suppose, right. although they would have, they might have a very particular mm. perspective that's different than the <laughs> That'd general That'd be a long population. conversation. <laughs> yeah. But um, so you can do that. You can look at what people are posting on social media, mm -hmm. um, what's being printed in the press, uh, or what, you know, experts who are looking at public opinion tell you. And if I take all of that into account, I, you know, it's clear to me that here in Uzbekistan, the, uh, opinions are split. 
that there's a split. I don't know what the split is. I can't say it's 50-50, 80-20, it's whatever. Say. It's hard it's to say. Split. It's definitely split. Um, and, 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 that, and that's something that we look at. But I have to say, going back to the, the start of your question about you know, appreciating the position that Uzbekistan is taking and whether there are hard feelings, mm -hmm, I think is mm -hmm. the word you used. Um, in terms of the bilateral relationship, no. There are, there are not hard feelings because, again, we understand completely the dilemma, you might say, that Uzbekistan faces, and we appreciate that. So I, I think the key here is Uzbekistan has staked, staked a position, and you know, if you look at the foreign minister's statement, this is clear, of uh, essentially neutrality, saying you know, we, we've had, we have deep historical and important relationships with Russia and with Ukraine, and we're not going to choose a side, essentially. So I think it's important that the one thing we would expect uh, as this, you know, because of the stakes and, and the important principles involved in this war is that that neutrality be real neutrality. That, that is, you know, if you're not going to... Genuine neutrality. Yeah, genuine neutrality. You're not going to... Yes, of course, we understand you're not going to be out there, um, you know... Criticizing. Criticizing the invasion or you know, providing the kind of aid that many countries in Europe are providing to Ukraine, you know, mm -hmm. military aid mm -hmm. and things of that nature. But it, you're also not going to be doing the same on the other side. You're not going to be cheering on or a aiding and abetting the, the other side. So I think that, that's something that America would look, look at and look for, is, is the neutrality, a genuine neutrality. But if it is, it's, again, understandable. And we, it, it doesn't change our basic belief that Uzbekistan is a strategic partner, that there is much that unites us and we have many common interests and that we, can, we want to continue building that relationship. The most coherent uh, answer I heard from the Uzbek officials so far is that, you know, we have to be super careful that, you know, Russia is scary. They don't hide that, that we are afraid of Russia.